Okay, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds, and it's a real privilege for me to introduce my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Ahmad Hussein, who has been in the trenches and an uh, integral member, tremendous addition to our advanced heart failure group. He earned his medical degree and graduated uh, with honors from Aga Khan University Medical College and completed both internship and residency um, at Emory and went on to the Mayo Clinic to do his general cardiology uh, fellowship. That was in Rochester, of course, and completed his advanced heart failure transplant um, fellowship at a, the large program University uh, of Washington in Seattle. So he really has expertise in transplant mechanical circulatory support and based on his uh, training, pulmonary hypertension. And his, he has a real research interest um, in heart failure with preserved EF, pulmonary hypertension, and RV dysfunction. And so for us, uh, again, just a, a, a tremendous addition to our group, and we very much look forward to his talk about RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension in FPEF. So, Maud, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to, uh, can you guys hear me first thing? Okay. All right, so um, the topic of my presentation today is something that is also a research interest of mine. It's basically right heart dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension pertaining to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So today, <clears throat> I'm gonna start off with a case, but then go into some of the data I had the opportunity to participate in while I was a, uh, at Mayo. So I wanna start off with the case. This case is kind of the backbone of this uh, talk. So, so if you guys can understand this ca case and, and, and keep it in mind, it would help when we talk about the data later on. So this is a 65 years old female who presents with progressive dyspnea on exertion and chest pressure that has been going on for a year and a half and she has NYHA class three symptoms. She has a history of previous hospitalizations for heart failure, no diabetes, hypertension, or chronic anemia. She, however, does have chronic atrial fibrillation and uh, unclear duration, but uh, she is on a rate control strategy for it and she takes warfarin for anticoagulation. Um, <clears throat> Physical exam, blood pressure is 136 by 84. BMI is 31. Um, the neck veins were elevated to the angle of the jaw. There was no S3, and there was minimal peripheral edema. Um, the NT pro BNP was mildly elevated at 627. Creatinine was elevated at 1.7. The patient has some chronic renal insufficiency, and the hemoglobin was 15.6. So cardiac medications this patient was on um, include warfarin, Lasix 40 once a day, metoprolol XL 50 milligrams a day, statins and coenzyme Q. This is her EKG. I, if I had time, I would have picked on some of the fellows, but uh, basically what it shows is uh, atrial fibrillation, right? It shows a right bundle branch block and a left anterior fascicular block. So that's kind of the main findings on this EKG. So this, guys, is uh, male format. So this is the LV. This is the right ventricle. So just because, I mean, we're, we're, we're different there. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, so, so this patient's echo showed, uh, as part of the evaluation, normal LV size, EF was 55%. LA volume index was severely elevated at 72. Normal, the cutoff has changed, as, as you know, per AAC guidelines, 34. Um, <clears throat> This is the Doppler data. The deceleration time is 140 milliseconds. E prime is 0 0.04 and with an EE prime of 32, okay? This is the CW Doppler waveform, the tricuspid valve showing an estimated RVSP of 34 millimeters of mercury. TAPSI was estimated at 14 millimeters and that is reduced. And just to point out that, as you can see, this is not a complete wave, uh, Doppler waveform so potentially the pulmonary artery systolic pressure could be underestimated. She proceeded with a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Um, for people who aren't familiar, peak VO2 is an estimate of cardiac output. It was reduced at 10.8 mLs per kilogram per minute. Anyone who's less than 12, we start considering transplant on. Uh, RER just tells you how good the effort was, it was very good, 1.23, so this was an adequate test. 
VEVCO2, the normal being 34, was elevated in 39, suggesting ventilatory inefficiency. Peak heart rate, 153 beats per minute. And her peak systolic blood pressure, as you can see, was blunted. If it, I, I don't know what her resting blood pressure was, but probably dropped with exercise. This is her coronary angiogram. I'm going to let it play for a second. She was complaining of chest pain, so she, she underwent a coronary angiogram. Okay. And then she had a right heart catheterization. So let's go over this. So mean RA pressure was 15, which is severely elevated. The wedge pressure was elevated at 23. Mean PA pressure was severely elevated at 50, giving you a transpulmonary gradient of 27. Cardiac output was low at 3.9. And the PVR with this calculation came out to be 6.9 wood units. And the LVDP was similar to the wedge at 25 millimeters of mercury. So with a show of hands, you know, so with the data you have so far, who would, so what additional data do you want or what would you do next? Who would like to get, do a NIPRI challenge right now in the cath lab with, with that data? Nobody. How about exercise? Who would like to exercise this patient? No. Inhaled nitric oxide? No takers. Dobutamine? No additional data needed? No one voted. <laughs> Were you guys hearing the case? <laughs> All right, okay. All right, I'll tell you then what happened. Um, so the patient did get inhaled nitric oxide, 80 parts per million for, for about five minutes. So this is what happened. Your wedge pressure went from 23 to 36. <coughs> Your mean PA pressure went from 50 to 45. As a result of that, because the wedge went up and the mean PA pressure came down a little bit, your transpulmonary gradient went from 27 to 9. Your cardiac output, in fact, dropped, and now the PVR is less than 3, or, which is kind of normal. It's not normal, but in, in this context of clinical management, it's normal, 2.68 wood units. This is the pulmonary capillary wedge form at baseline, and then you see when nitric oxide was given, you see this really prominent V wave. It hits 60 millimeters of mercury. It's very, very prominent. It's gigantic, actually. So, so the patient had a concomitant echo that showed no significant MR. So in that context, a peak V wave does suggest se severe diastolic dysfunction. Now, <laughs> what is the diagnosis? So is this idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension? Who thinks that's it's idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension? Okay. Who thinks it's HEFPEF with pH? Okay, so it's a voters. Symptomatic, <laughs> symptomatic AFib, anybody? Okay, age, obesity, and deconditioning. No? And cardiac syndrome X, probably no takers. Okay. All right, so then the question is, now you know the diagnosis. Well, there's also the topic of the talk, the heart HEFPEF with secondary pulmonary hypertension. The, the challenging thing is how would you treat this patient? Who would give this patient amlodipine? Okay, who would give or put her on an ACE inhibitor for treatment of hypertension? Nobody? How about inserting a cardiomems and, you know, she does have a history of recurrent heart failure. Uh, you, you think so? Okay. How about a PDE5 inhibitor like sildenafil? Okay, we have two, three, four, okay, actually several people who would like uh, PDE5. And rhythm control? Anybody for, can, put, okay, there's another couple of votes for rhythm control. So. All right, so I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna try and decipher these, these options here so that we can get some sense of what, what, what HEFPEF treatment is like these days. So this is a, uh, just to go over what a pulmonary vasodilator test is for people who are not familiar with the cath lab. When you give inhaled nitric oxide, there are several things that you want that should happen. First of all, if you're starting with severe pulmonary hypertension, your mean PA pressure to, should decrease by greater than 10 millimeters of mercury to an absolute number less than 40 millimeters of mercury. So the number has to be below 40. And your cardiac output should either increase or remain the same but not worsen, okay? So if you meet all those criteria, then you are considered responsive, nitric oxide responsive, and you can be treated with calcium channel blockers like the first option, which was amlodipine. So look here, the mean PA pressure came down, but not by 10 points and not to less than 40, number one. Number two, the cardiac output, in fact, dropped. And number three, um, <clears throat> this patient, to be honest, had an elevated wedge pressure to begin with, uh, which is quite moderate to severely elevated. So 
This is not group 1 PA pulmonary arterial hypertension, and, and so amlodipine probably would not have been a good choice. Um, we can talk about where we could use that, though, in, later on. So what about RAS antagonists in heart failure preserved ejection fraction? I think this slide will suffice. This is a meta-analysis of 8,021 patients taking into account some of the landmark RAS inhibition trials, including CHARM, PEP-CHF, and iPreserve. And what you see, there is actually no benefit of ACE inhibitors or RAS antagonism in form of reducing heart failure hospitalization or mortality in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Okay, so that's the concept behind that. So what about the CardioMEMS? So this is what a CardioMEMS device looks like. Um, and basically, <clears throat> this is a, a device that is placed into the descending branch of one of the left, pre preferably the left pulmonary artery, as you can see right here. And, and it endothelializes over one month. So once you implant this device, you should be on aspirin Plavix for about a month, after which you should be on aspirin indefinitely. So what happens is, after implantation, the patient lays on, uh, takes this equipment home, right? Lays on this pillow every day and transmits uh, this, this uh, via wireless to, to a heart failure website. And this heart failure website tracks this data, the trends of pulmonary artery pressures, systolic, diastolic, and mean, and then this is stored. And this is usually, um, basically, uh, we either have a heart failure registered nurse dependent upon your program, or a nurse practitioner or a physician who's looking at this data and making relevant changes. And so the, the landmark trial behind this was the Champion clinical trial. And basically what it showed was right here that in HEF-PEF patients in the Champion, enrolled in the Champion trial, at six months there was a 50% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So it's one of the few therapies that showed some benefit in reducing heart failure hospitalizations. Now, <clears throat> before I move on to sildenafil, the landmark trial that tested sildenafil use in HEFPEF was the RELAX trial. And let me just go a little bit over the rationale for use. So both nitric oxide and the natriuretic peptide pathways, by the way, these are pathways that are antifibrotic, antihypertrophic. These are the beneficial pathways that are activated when you are in heart failure. Um, well, both of these act via the cyclic GMP pathway to exert downstream beneficial cardiovascular effects. PDE5 is an enzyme that degrades cyclic GMP. So sildenafil or any PDE5 inhibitor will in fact increase this and then as a result have better downstream beneficial cardiovascular effects, okay? In very simplistic terms. So that was the rationale for the RELAX trial and there was a lot of data whether it was experimental in the animal models or in the form of small clinical studies that showed not only would that benefit be in the heart, but it would have beneficial effects on the lungs in terms of oxygen utilization in the periphery, in terms of skeletal muscle oxygen utilization, as well as the kidneys. So that was the rationale for the RELAX trial. So what was the RELAX trial? So it was a double-blind, one-to-one uh, randomized control trial. So you were either randomized to placebo or sildenafil 20 milligrams TID. There was baseline data that was uh, basically obtained that include cardiopulmonary tests, six-minute walk test, echo, and Minnesota living with heart failure questionnaire as a symptom assessment, biomarkers, and cardiac MRI in patients who were in sinus rhythm. Once you were on sildenafil after 12 weeks, if you tolerated this dose or if you tolerated placebo, you were increased to 60 milligrams TID and a placebo uh, or placebo. And at 24 weeks, you, were, you, you would get your final data and see if there was any benefit. So you had, the, the beauty of this trial was this was a tr truly tested functional capacity because it did cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So this is the very brief summary in a nutshell of the primary endpoint of the RELAX trial. So in terms of change in peak VO2, whether you're randomized to sildenafil or placebo, there was no difference. In fact, there, were some, there was some hint in terms of worsening renal function on patients who were on, uh, randomized to sildenafil. So this was a negative trial. Um, <clears throat> however, coming back to our patient, our, you remember our patient? I showed you the data. Our patient was, in fact, enrolled in the RELAX trial. She was either randomized to sildenafil or placebo, but then at 24 uh, weeks, she had dramatic, uh, actually at 12 weeks, she had dramatic improvement in NYHA class. She went from class three to almost one to two. And uh, you can see it's not unprecedented. Look at her baseline peak VO2 
it went up to 16.4 at 12 weeks and this effect was sustained at 24 weeks. So was this patient questionably a sildenafil responder? That is the question that comes in mind. And this is just the actual peak VO2 plot as you can see that this effect was sustained. So this is uh, green is at 24 weeks and 12 weeks is the purple. And as you can see, there was a significant improvement in peak VO2 in this particular patient, although the overall trial was <laughs> negative. So let, let, just to mention in completeness, um, there was another single center trial in sildenafil use in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It was by Guazi. It was published in circulation in 2011. And it showed benefits in terms of sildenafil use. But let, I just want to point out some of the very striking features of the hemodynamics of the patients that were enrolled in this single center study. Look at the RA pressure. It exceeds the wedge pressure. And putting that together with the TAPSI as low as 11, this, these patients had severe RV dysfunction. The wedge was elevated, so, so the, these were HEFPEF patients. And the mean PA pressure was 39, which was at least moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension. But they had high PVR, significant RV dysfunction. <clears throat> so this study was accompanied by an editorial. And that editorial really brought forward two points. The first thing they raised is that the characteristics of the subjects that were enrolled in this single center study was actually atypical to the amount of RV failure that they saw is atypical for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But then they also commented that maybe patients with HEFPEF who have RV dysfunction are in fact a subgroup that will respond to sildenafil rather than the relaxed trial which is generalized sildenafil use to everyone. Maybe the patients who have RV dysfunction will respond to sildenafil, okay? So, so that triggered a series of investigations and I, I was part of <clears throat> all of them. Um, so the first one on the left, I, I wanna tell you these studies because I'm gonna quote them as I go along. So the first one was uh, published in Circulation 2014. This was a community-based HEFPEF cohort of 562 patients that had documented HEFPEF prospectively using Framingham criteria and echocardiography. And the prevalence of RV dysfunction and HEFPEF in this population, if you defined it by TAPSI or semi-quantitative, like our echo lab that uses, uses just a semi-quantitative effort of, of, of quantifying RV dysfunction, of about one-third of patients. Then there was a, a cohort. This is a referral cohort. It's an inpatient cohort that was referred to the cath lab um, that was diagnosed with heart failure preserved ejection fraction. The prevalence of RV dysfunction in that cohort using RV fractional area change less than 35% as, as, as how, to, uh, how to define it was also about one third. So, so the first thing uh, to take home is RV dysfunction and HEFPEF is common. I mean, one third of patients is a lot of patients. As you know, 50% of the burden of entire heart failure is HEFPEF. So one third of that having significant RV dysfunction is an important fact to know. Not only is it common, it is associated with adverse outcomes. So in this uh, circulation paper, um, <clears throat> so what you see is if you have, this is survival, this is a survival over time. What you see is whether you use TAPSI or semi-quantitative quantification, if you have R any RV dysfunction by semi-quantitative RV function, or TAPSI defined as uh, less than 16 or less by ASC criteria, you have significantly worse prognosis compared to if you did not have RV dysfunction and have PEF. And this was adjusted for all factors that are known to predict mortality and heart failure preserved ejection fraction. So adjusted for pulmonary artery systolic pressure, age, sex, and all comorbidities. So, so very strong data suggesting that RV dysfunction HEFPEF is a strong predictor of mortality. And this was even more. So this was the cath, the inpatient cohort. As you can see, the median two-year survival in patients who had RV dysfunction with HEFPEF was only 56% compared to 93%. So very strong predictor of mortality, RV dysfunction and heart failure, preserved ejection fraction. So both of these studies, the outpatient cohort and inpatient cohort, were accompanied by editorials out of Mass General and Brigham. And what they pointed out was that means that we need to identify a subgroup that responds to PD-5 inhibition. That means you need to, there, within the HEFPEF cohort, there, are, there is a subpopulation that likely has abnormal um, RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension that is likely going to respond to PD-5 inhibition. And they question that what are then the mechanisms of RV dysfunction 
in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If it's so common and it's prognostically important, what's causing it? So I'm going to go over some of the mechanisms that I, I find that might be importantly playing a role here. So one is very obvious. As you know, RVs after load is going to be the most important thing that's going to predict survival and, or be a mechanism of RV dysfunction. And that was a, an obvious thing, that one of the predictors of RV dysfunction in HEFPEF in both of these studies was pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Now, as you know, compared to the left ventricle, the right ventricle, with the same increase in afterload, look at the drop in stroke volume of the RV as compared to the left ventricle. So the RV in, in general is way more afterload sensitive. Now, in, in that study, they, looked, they compared HEFPEF with controls. So that means if you have HEFPEF, your afterload sensitivity is even more enhanced. So let me show you how. So this is fractional RV, fractional area change. This is mean PA pressure. So with the same change in pressure, in con normal controls versus half PEF, you have a much more uh, decline in RV fractional area change. So not only is, uh, are, 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 are they, uh, is the RV afterload sensitive in half PEF, they are, there's heightened afterload sensitivity, all right? So if they're so afterload sensitive, I just wanted to make a point here, which I'm going to talk about later. If they're so afterload sensitive, that means that all of these parameters that we use to define RV dysfunction, like TAPSI or RV fractional area change, or even MRI, which is the gold standard RV ejection fraction, they're very load dependent. So, so it is an important concept to think about RVPA coupling. That means when you talk about RV dysfunction, you index it to the current load on the, on the heart. So it's something called RVPA coupling, which we will talk about in just a moment here, but just hold that thought for now. So first, predictorized for RV dysfunction, as I said, was atrial fibrillation. Then, uh, sorry, sorry, was uh, uh, afterload or pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Another important predictor of RV dysfunction in HEFPEF was atrial fibrillation. So in the, in the outpatient cohort, there was 64% of the patients that RV dysfunction had atrial fibrillation. And then the odds of having atrial fibrillation in, uh, as a predictor of RV dysfunction in HEFPEF uh, odds ratio was 4.2 in the inpatient cohort. So what does AFib have to do with causing RV dysfunction. So this is what we're going to go into right now. But first thing to recognize is AFib is very common in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Two thirds of patients with HEFPEF some, at some point during their lifetime either have or will develop atrial fibrillation. So AFib and um, HEFPEF go hand in hand. So in this, what I'm trying to point out here is this is a proof of concept that even when you adjust for afterload, AFib is a predictive RV dysfunction. So I'm going to show you here. So for the same change in PA pressure here versus here, this is HEFPEP patient to sinus rhythm, and these are HEFPEP patients in atrial fibrillation. For the same PA pressure, you have low RV fractional area change, suggesting that there is a mechanism that is outside of afterload that is causing atrial fibrillation um, in, 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 in HEFPEF. Uh, RV dysfunction and heart failure preserved ejection fraction. So let me go into how that can happen. So think about this. When you assess ventricular function, you know it's predominantly LV systolic function is radial. It's a radial function. Whereas the RV, it is longitudinal, all right? The reason for that is that the left ventricle, uh, sorry, the RV lacks the endocardial and epicardial transverse layers. So in red here and in blue, the RV typically lacks these transverse fibers, so predominantly is dependent upon longitudinal muscle fibers for contraction. So about 75% of RV systolic function is in fact longitudinal function, okay? And this is just that mo a, a, a reconstruction model, 3D reconstruction model, just showing you that exact thing. Just look at it. It's a longitudinal contraction. It is not transverse. 25 to 30% is radial but majority, 75, 75% is, is in fact longitudinal. So why is that important? Well, the way that's important is, look how you measure TAPSI. When you measure TAPSI, this is how you measure TAPSI in sinus rhythm, right? So what happens is with atrial contraction, your tricuspid annulus actually moves away from the apex of the heart. Now imagine you're in atrial fibrillation, you lose this atrial contraction. You see here, you lose it. So automatically, your TAPSI is reduced. So your longitudinal function, just by the fact of being in atrial fibrillation, will be reduced. So it, it makes sense why AFib can directly cause RV dysfunction. Not only that, I'll prove it to you. 
So these were patients in lone atrial fibrillation that they took, that predominantly lone atrial fibrillations, a few of them had hypertension, who came for cardioversion at AFib. Look at their TAPSI, about 12, 13 millimeters at prior to cardioversion. Two hours post, it was 16, 17. One month post, it was 25. It had completely normalized. So restoring sinus rhythm in these patients it was a proof of concept that your RV function improves, all right? So that's that. What is other possible thing that can happen with tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy uh, with atrial fibrillation is tachycardia. So just like you get tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy on the left ventricle, it is possible that you get the same phenomena on the right side, right? It, it makes sense. Well, there is some data to support this. So this is interesting. I found it quite intriguing. So there was an MRI-based study out of Japan that were trying to diagnose, based on MRI, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy versus dilated cardiomyopathy. And the concept was as follows. They took patients with new-onset LV dysfunction and where there was a dilemma in the diagnosis. One month after their diagnosis, they did a cardiac MRI on them, and they took some readings. And they followed those patients for a year. Patients who normalized their ejection fraction in their biventricular systolic function at one year was labeled as tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Within one year, if you did not normalize your, 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 your function, systolic function, you were labeled as having dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, an important thing they found is that with, as opposed to dilate, and then, then one more concept, one more key concept. So the concept is that tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy is a relatively new onset diagnosis. Whereas a dilated cardiomyopathy, if you're going to develop RV dysfunction in a dilated cardiomyopathy, it will be with progression of heart failure. So it would be over a period of time, not immediately. So they used RV function as a way to distinguish tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy from dilated cardiomyopathy. So what they found was if you're, uh, so dilated cardiomyopathy is in red, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy is in blue. You can see that the RV ejection fraction was much lower on the MRIs one month after diagnosis in patients who were uh, who had tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Also, their RV and diastolic volume was greater. They also looked at the ratio of RV ejection fraction to LV ejection fraction, which was lower in the TIC group or tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy group as opposed to dilated cardiomyopathy group. Same thing with the RV and diastolic volume to LV and diastolic volume. So using that, they actually came up with a, 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 a predictor. They, they, they basically said if your RV ejection fraction to LV ejection fraction is less than 1.05, in other words, stating that your RV ejection fraction is significantly decreased, uh, you had a 91.5% specificity to, per, uh, to predict. It wasn't very sensitive, but it was specific to predict tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So in other words, early on after development of tachycardia, you can develop or this is an indirect suggestion that you can develop, develop RV systolic dysfunction. So atrial fibrillation can work via two mechanisms. One is which I told you, which is the loss of atrial contraction, and the other could be the tachycardia that comes with it. All right? One more uh, thing that came up in, in, in the um, community-based studies as a predictor of RV dysfunction in HEFPEF was RV pacing. And I found that intriguing, so I tried to look it up a little bit. So, the concept that they portrayed is that in, when you have RV pacing, you have mechanical dyssynchrony, and mechanical dyssynchrony in some way causes right heart dysfunction. So thinking about it, I, I feel like if you're, uh, well, I mean, it's known that if you ha have RV apical pacing, you stimulate the septum before you stimulate the RV free wall. And why is that important? Well, the reason why that's important is this is what the transverse fibers look like in, in, in the heart. So starting from the free wall, the transverse fibers, myocardial fibers, they are in continuation with the left ventricle. And they cross the septum here. As you can see that, it's like very clear. So in other words, if you have a dyssynchrony of your left ventricle, to some extent, 20 to 30% is the predicted, that LV systolic function improved or normal LV systolic is important for RV systolic function. So in other words, if you have dyssynchrony, there is a possibility that you will develop RV dysfunction. And this was tested in the, uh, indirectly tested in, in the MADIT CRT trial where they showed that patients who underwent CRT, now this is a, uh, I want you to understand, this. so what you're seeing downstairs here 
is tertiles of improvement in LV ejection fraction. So a little bit of LV, uh, improvement in LV ejection fraction, more, more, so this is progressively more increase in LV ejection fraction. The, what you see on the y-axis is RV fractional area change. So the people who benefited from CRT, the more improvement they had in their LV ejection fraction, the more improvement they had in their RV fractional area change. So that means by getting rid of mechanical dyssynchrony and by improving LV ejection fraction, you in fact directly improved RV ejection fraction by that mechanism that I just explained to you, that the, the, they're to 20 to 30 percent dependent on, 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 on for, uh, the, the, tr the transverse function for RV systolic function. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> and not only that, I found a very interesting case report in heart rhythm case reports. And they had a patient who had sinus node dysfunction, underwent a dual chamber permanent pacemaker implantation. Then after about three years, he came with NYHA class um, three symptoms. They evaluated him, they found normal LV function, they did a coronary angiogram, he had no coronary artery disease. But then on imaging, they found isolated RV or right-sided heart enlargement. They took the patient for right heart catheterization, and they found uh, uh, hemodynamics that were consistent with RV failure, like RA pressure exceeding wedge and a low cardiac output. And they did CRT on this patient, and this patient's RV dysfunction completely went away. He went to class one. So this is actually, I thought, although it's a case report, it was a proof of concept that you can develop pacing-induced RV dysfunction that may be correctable with CRT. So I've shown you a MADIS CRT trial and then this case where I think it's convincing enough to at least, or at least intriguing. Then the last mechanism I want to go over uh, is that just understand that heart failure preserved ejection fraction is defined by comorbidities. This, this is a disease of comorbidities. It is very different from HEFREF where you have an ischemic insult and then down the line you have neurohormonal activation and you develop heart failure. HEFPEF is a disease of comorbidities. And, and the theory that Paulus came up with is that if you have all these comorbidities, they result in a chronic inflammatory state that re re lead to release of inflammatory cytokines that then lead to uh, the, uh, the creation of reactive oxygen species that act as nitric oxide scavengers, and I've already told you that nitric oxide is a beneficial pathway in heart failure. And so you have more reactive oxygen species downstream via TGF beta pathway and via inhibiting the cyclic GMP pathway. This causes fibrosis, causes hypertrophy, it ca increases apoptosis, and leads to the uh, heart failure, um, uh, which you call phenotype. All right, so, so we actually showed that uh, in, a, in, our, in a circulation model, uh, and sorry, in circulation in a uh, basically autopsy model of patients who had HEFPEF and controls that compared to controls, patients with HEFPEF did have this chronic inflammation going on uh, histologically, and they in fact had what we call coronary microvascular rarefaction or decreased capillary density. So, so, so this is a concept that Chronic inflammation could cause myocardial fibrosis, and, and that is something that could be going on in the right ventricle. In fact, this was shown in a rat model of pulmonary arterial hypertension, where, where they showed that um, this is uh, basically tomato lectin. It's staining, basically staining endothelial cells. <clears throat> so compared to control in RV failure, you don't have endothelial cell, uh, and much endothelial cell uh, staining, because either because they're dead or they have made a transition to a different type of cell. And then compared to controls in RV failure, you see all this fibrosis. <clears throat> so what could be the, one of the mechanisms, and I think Dr. Bimraj is here and Asher here, that one of the mechanisms of RV failure could be that there is a EMT, there is endothelial cell mesenchymal uh, transformation. And, and this is related to the chronic inflammation, increased oxidative stress, and this EMT is happening. This has not been shown in, 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 in humans in HEFPEF but it has been shown in animal models, uh, as I, I just pointed out to you in PAH. So something in terms of, especially in terms of research, that there, this EMT may be going on that, as, as, that causes downstream fibrosis and as, as a matter of fact, a mechanism of RV dysfunction in HEFPEF. So now I wanna come back to this TAPC to PASP relationship that I told you about. So I told you that all parameters that we use to measure echo, all the, um, echo parameters or whether they're MRI parameters of RV function are in fact load dependent. So there's a concept that if you 
index it to load, or if you adjust it for after load, so if you adjust it for pulmonary artery systolic pressure, for instance, that, that that would be a better way of looking at RV function and heart failure. So, so this study is by Guazi. It They used the TAPC to PASP relationship in heart failure. What you see in red are HEF-REF patients, and what you see in blue in HEF-HEF patients. And the point is whether, regardless of the type of heart failure that they have, if their TAPC to PASP relationship, if their, that ratio was less than 0.35, they had significantly reduced survival as compared to if they did not have that ratio. So indexing it to afterload, this is about a median two-year survival, how significantly reduced that is if your TAPC to PSP ratio is less than 0.35, okay? So, <clears throat> so when we talked about the mechanisms of RV dysfunction, now it's, we, the second thing is, is there, is there a subgroup that responds to, uh, is there a subgroup in HEFPEF that will respond to uh, sildenafil? And that predicted was that would be the group that has abnormal RVPA coupling. So that is what we studied in this paper that came out in CERC heart failure. And what we hypothesized that our adverse RVPA coupling is associated with more severe heart failure as evidenced by not only clinical but biomarker profiles and it is also associated with reduced exercise capacity. So one, the important thing here is prior to this study, no one had shown, although it was known that RV function is a very is a perhaps the strongest predictor of exercise capacity in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but no one had shown that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The other thing we hypothesized, this was an, as I said, this was an ancillary study of the relaxed trials, a post-doc analysis that if we chose this, uh, this subgroup with RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension, that 24 weeks of sildenafil will improve exercise capacity because that the, was the primary endpoint of the RELAX trial. They tested exercise capacity. So we divided <coughs> our RVPA coupling groups into four groups that are easy to understand. So the worst group will be those that we think are the target population that have RV dysfunction and then have pulmonary hypertension. Then you have a normal group that have a normal RV and no pulmonary hypertension and then some intermediate groups. So p patients that have just pulmonary hypertension and normal RV function, and then RV dysfunction and no pulmonary hypertension. The way we defined it is standard TAPC 16 or less, and the PASP greater than 40 would define them into these groups. So as you can see, look at the TAPC to PASP ratio. In this adverse group, it is 0 0.2, so it's significantly less than what Guazi showed at 0.35. So if at all this group is that high-risk group, and, and we would hope that this would respond to sildenafil. So I'm going to go over some of the results. So the important thing was that in this group, one again, this comes over and over again, look at the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in the RV dysfunction group, 82% compared to patients that did not have RV dysfunction, only 30%. So it was a stark difference, again suggesting that AFib has some relationship with RV dysfunction in HEFPEF. So if you look at the biomarker profiles, it doesn't really matter all across the board except for galactin-3, markers of neurohormonal activation, inflammation, oxidative stress, fibrosis. They were all significantly worse as you move from the least uh, high-risk group to the highest-risk group with RV dysfunction pulmonary hypertension. Same thing for diastology. Sorry, let me, I'm just going to show you. So as, as you go across uh, from less to more abnormal RVPA coupling, you see that all indices of diastol diastology get worse. Deceleration time gets shorter. EE prime goes higher. EA ratio goes higher. LA volume index goes higher. So this is a sicker population that have likely more severe heart failure. Now, when we look at uh, exercise capacity, it is what we predicted. So as you, as, as, you, as you go into the abnormal, most abnormal RVPA coupling group, you have the least peak VO2 and the highest VEVCO2. So th this does make sense that this is a subgroup that is sicker. Unfortunately, whether you look at change in TAPSI, change in peak VO2, or VEVCO2, even in the group with the most, uh, so there was no interaction. So even in, with the group with RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension, you see that unfortunately there was no benefit, at least in, in our subcohort of the RELAX trial that had this abnormal RVPA coupling. So we had, uh, we should, could not show a benefit in, in terms of improvement exercise capacity or improvement in RV dysfunction with sildenafil use. However, this trial, going back to this single center study, did show uh, benefits sildenafil on RV function, clinical status, and hemodynamics. So what is the difference between ours and theirs? 
Well, some of them are, are very important. So first thing is that Guazi's um, population of HEFPEF patients was very atypical. The only comorbidity they had was hypertensive heart disease. They did clearly had diastolic dysfunction, but excluded patients with other significant comorbidities, including diabetes, CKD, pulmonary disease. And as you know, this is very common in HEFPEF. So that kind of population is not the real world population that we're taking care of. And in particular, it excluded patients with atrial fibrillation. So as you know, in our RV dysfunction pH group, the most abnormal RV pH coupling group, we had an 82% prevalence of AFib. So it is possible that sildenafil may work when you're in sinus rhythm, but because AFib in itself causes RV dysfunction, then it won't work in that population. So it makes some sense. I think that's my most likely the issue. The other unfortunate thing is that the relaxed trial, although it's the landmark trial of sildenafil use, in HEFPEF did not invasively measure hemodynamics. So when they say they define pulmonary hypertension, that, that could be all driven by wedge, or that could be mixed pulmonary hypertension in which your pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. And I think that the group that does respond to sildenafil is you have to have elevated PVR, and that's not what the relaxed trial tested. Now, Guazi did look at PVR, but his group was not representative of the general population of HEFPEF patients. Okay. So our patient, though, still was in the relaxed trial and responded to sildenafil. So why did this patient improve? Well, it comes out this patient was, was getting M&Ms all along. The patient was randomized to placebo, but had improvement in, in peak VO2. Why is that? Look at the baseline peak VO2. This patient is in atrial fibrillation. At 12 weeks, this patient is in sinus rhythm. So she spontaneously converted into sinus rhythm, and she had an improvement in peak VO2. Not only did she have an improvement in peak VO2, she also had an improvement in RV function. So you look here, this is baseline, as you see, TAPC is 14. I think even you don't have to be an echocardiographer to see that this annual excursion is significantly more, that TAPC was 22 millimeters. So, so, so in other words, the RV, just by going into sinus rhythm, she had an improvement in peak VO2, and she had an improvement in TAPC and RV function, at least as defined by TAPC. Just a final comment on AFib intervention trials that either included or tested patients with heart failure, HEFPEP patients were underrepresented. And the crux of that was that rhythm control may improve exercise capacity, but not outcomes in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So that is our current AFib intervention trials that we have. This is the data that they show. They support that there may be in HEFREF some improvement in symptoms, but there was no improvement in outcomes. So that's just, just a thing to keep in mind. So I'll summarize here. RV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, first take home point is very common in heart failure. No matter how you define it, whether using a community-based or a referral-based cohort, or regardless of the RV function parameter that you use, TAPSI, fractional area change, RV ejection fraction, it is about one-third, roughly. One-third of the population is a very common condition to have in HEFPEF. The mechanisms of RV dysfunction, group 2 pH, we know. Increased afterload is, is an obvious one. I think AFib is an important mechanism of RV dysfunction in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and I've shown you some of them, the things like loss of atrial mechanical function and, and rate and irregularity. The systemic nature of HEFPEF, the chronic inflammatory process that we talked about that can cause oxidative stress and downstream lead to fibrosis, and that is because it's a systemic process, it can affect the right ventricle. So what did we find? So in our relaxed trial, we found that pH to RVD was common. How they had more severe heart failure, more diastolic dysfunction, more neurohormonal activation, higher inflammatory markers of inflammation, oxidative stress, and pro-fibrotic markers. And they had worse exercise capacity and great, greater ventilatory inefficiency. However, at least in the relaxed trial subcohort that we had studied, sildenafil did not have a beneficial effects in patients with RV dysfunction and more adverse RVPA coupling, as we just discussed. Neither did their TAPS improve, nor did their peak VO2 improve. In fact, um, their ventilatory inefficiency actually got worse, at least in our group. And I kind of tried to decipher that we had AFib, so it's possible that if, if the patients were in sinus rhythm, they would have responded differently. So currently, I have to conclude that there's no evidence to support the use of PDA5 inhibition in an unselected HEFPEP population or with a HEFPEP population that have RV dysfunction and pH by echo. However, I still hold the point, as I've explained, that if you have patients in sinus rhythm that are invasively 
quantified as having elevated PVR and they have RV dysfunction in HEFEP, I still feel sildenafil has a role. It has to be studied. It has not been studied in this population. But I if it was, I think that it, would, it will show benefit. Um, and then uh, that I just told you that, I mean, I don't think Gwazi's uh, basically study represented the run-of-the-mill HEFEP patients. And lastly, I would like to say that rhythm control strategy may improve exercise capacity, RV function, and potentially outcomes in this HEFPEF cohort with our abnormal RVPA coupling. And I showed you some data, including our own patient who, who had a dramatic improvement uh, when she was in sinus rhythm. So thank you. All right. Imad, thank you for That's that uh, wonderful That's overview. And I'd like to congratulate you on your journey as it relates to you know, being a fellow and being inquisitive and yeah. trying to understand what is a complex right, syndrome and it's a person like you that's going to define it and understand right, it right, to right. where then we can make a difference certainly as a, uh, as a, as a team, yes, team if you will. So fantastic uh, presentation and review. Let's jump right into questions. We'll start off with Dr. Bimara. Yeah. Imad, uh, thank you again for uh, being the diastologist uh, for, you know, for our group. Dr. Naga is here, so I'm <laughs> He's the imaging astrologist. <laughs> okay. so in, in going back to your case, and, and, and one of the questions of, you know, when we look at transpulmonary gradient and diastolic gra uh, pressure gradient, DPG, when your wedge is 23, um, one, a lot of times we kind of not use nitric oxide because uh, we know that it's going to flood the left side. But what's interesting, and I don't know if there's any data on this, is you have a high wedge versus having a high wedge with a tall V wave mm -hmm. without MR suggesting bad compliance of the left atrium, to me, I think, is a worse sign than just having a high wedge. Mm -hmm. So in your case, interestingly, when you use nitric and flooded the left side, you mm -hmm. actually unraveled that. Yeah. Not, o not only that, um, so if you look here, so what happens is, uh, so in HEFPAF, what happens is, in the, if you look at the initial hemodynamics, you see that the PVR was actually elevated at 6.9, suggesting that there is an elevated TPG. I would not have given, if I were doing this study, I would give this patient nitride challenge, not nitric oxide challenge, I agree with you. But because they gave nitric oxide challenge, it, it put forward a very important concept that this pulmonary hypertension was reactive. This was not where there was irreversible remodeling causing elevated PVR, because by giving nitric oxide and dilating the pulmonary arterial circuit, your, your PVR normalized, or, or at least clinically normalized. So, that, so I would not I agree with you. I would not have given nitric oxide challenge. I would have done nipride. But is there a role to plug the left atrium to reveal the compliance with the V-wave, right? I mean, to yeah. me, that wedge baseline to me is a high wedge. But then yeah. when you have that tall V-wave, I don't yeah. know if there is a prognostication there is a right. prognostication if you it, there's a Borlaug paper he's a, that if you have a giant p uh, uh, giant v waves on your on your primary capillary wedge waveform they have much more severe diastolic dysfunction and that does relate to prognosis in 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 an inpatient cohort uh, those are that, that's a referral bias there there's sicker patients in general but um but yes th this is a worse marker than if you did not have a, a larger v wave uh, just I mean, to answer your question is the largest paper, I mean, the paper with the largest number of patients <coughs> looking at nitric oxide in HEFPEF is from Irene Lang, where she did not show that with, uh, you know, in pa patients with elevated wedge pressure, if you give nitric oxide, the, uh, the increase in wedge pressure uh, is not as much as uh, here shown in this case. So, uh, but of course, you know, exercise or saline loading, uh, again, can bring out that. Um, so, uh, you want great talk. Uh, two questions. One thing is you know, with Guazi's paper and your RELAX uh, sub-study, do you think that, like you said, there are two phenotypes where people who have PAH with concomitant diastolic dysfunction, where the left atrial compliance is likely normal and not really contributing much to, uh, you know, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, and whereas your patients have mostly really oh, have, the, the, the main problem is l poor left atrial compliance. So given that, are we really barking up the wrong tree? You know, nobody really talks about left atrial compliance and left atrial myopathy as a problem, and we are really focusing on the downstream effect on the RV. Should we be m focusing more on what to do about the left atrium, including you know, drugs or devices? 
Well, I, 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 I completely agree. I, I, you know, as you know, we are now participating in the Corvia Lab heart failure trial, which is basically going to be an intraatrial septal device for those who don't know. For patients with HEFPEF with refractory heart failure symptoms uh, who have elevated wedge pressures, um, by implanting this a five millimeter, it is a conscious effort to make a shunt across the atrium that will s sort of serve as a pop-off valve. In the absence of reversing fibrosis, you mean if, uh, that, that would uh, likely improve symptoms in, in, in patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So they are st moving more towards thinking about the left side. But just one comment um, that um, the, a prominent V wave of hitting 60 is uh, uh, if it's not in the absence, if it's in the absence of MR, it does not, you can, it does not necessarily mean it's, it's, it's a left atrial compliance issue. Actually, abnormal LV compliance will also give you a, 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 a very prominent V wave. And so, so if you really want to know if it's the left atrial compliance issue, then you would do transeptal puncture and you will do a left atrial waveform and an LVDP, and then you'll have a better idea, uh, or the wedge, I'm sorry, and then you'll have an, a better idea of what's called, which is, uh, or in a lot of times in HEFPEF, they're, they're both non-compliant, the, the, the atrium and the left ventricle, and so it's really hard to tease out. So, but, but yes, but we should more focus more on the left side in this population rather than trying to see um, how it, that we can alter the pulmonary vasculature. Okay. Well, I'm starting now. All right, sir. Great talk. So, you know, I've been in clinical practice for 20 years. I think this is one of the most difficult diagnoses for us to take care of. Yeah. Well, because almost like there is no therapy and we have struggled for years and years. Um, do we not have any therapy because we, by the time we detect RV dysfunction, is too late? In other words, most of the patients I remember over years, by the time I see them and we would do an echo, their RV is just completely gone. Um, you know, I mean, left side, I think we have better mechanisms of early detection of LV dysfunction, uh, whether it's echo or whatever else. Like, for example, even your PDF-5 uh, trials, do you, one almost wonders if earlier intervention, earlier detection and earlier intervention is offered, mm -hmm. is it possible to prevent RV dysfunction where it becomes irreversible after a certain state? Yeah, I mean, that is a very good concept. In general, that, that makes a lot of sense because by the time you have fi uh, fibrosis, uh, within, whether it's within the LV or the right side of the heart myocardium, then it, it, it's more advanced. It's very difficult to, to, to reverse that condition. So, I mean, how to pick up HEFPEF at an earlier stage? Well, I can tell you in terms of RV dysfunction, if you have early onset uh, if you, AFib in a setting of HEFPEF, you can develop RV dysfunction without that concept in which you have long-standing left-sided heart failure causing RV failure, because that we're saying is from afterload. I think there are more mechanisms in RV dysfunction, that's what I kind of went over today, that are, that are above and beyond just afterload as a result of the left side failing. But in general, uh, I, I, I think that that's the, where we need to focus. But, but, but that is not, I think the major challenge there would be, how are you gonna identify those patients at an early stage? Are, are you talking about general screening? Or, because by the time they come to you, they're symptomatic. Right, I mean, so that's. Again, um, great presentation. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. And I, I actually, um, my question is a segue from what was just asked by Dr. Shah. Uh, this is a very challenging patient cohort. And, uh, and in your practice, with your analyzing all the uh, patients that you have done, what are the general uh, signals, whether it be echocardiographic, um, clinical, comorbidities that you use to take your patient from what you have seen just from non-invasive modality to the cath lab. Yeah. I, I, do, I do think that we struggle with that because yeah. it is an invasive testing. Right. And, and what is it that triggered that moment for you? And the next, just one more other question is the importance of nitric oxide pathway. I mean, we recognize this. Um, and, and the timing of, of when to utilize that treatment, I think that is really critically important. important. I, myself, like you, uh, I've had success with sildenafil, but timing of who to apply it to, I think that is really the, the sort of the black box we're trying to get through. But, um, but if we do it too early, uh, and if we, you know, we, can, you, we can use exercise with our cath to, to uncover some of the pulmonary hypertension, <clears throat> is that really the right direction to go? Sure. And, and, and how can we tease this out a little bit more? Sure. So, uh, Dr. Park, thank you. So, so first question is, in clinical practice, who, 
who do we refer for right heart catheterization? So typically patients, I, in my, I, at least from my perspective, who are, uh, continue to be symptomatic despite hypertension management, despite diuretic management, and especially those patients who I place on diuretics and have worsening renal function on diuretics, uh, those are patients that I, I want to define invasively um, what their pressures are and if they have pulmonary hypertension. And if they do have pulmonary hypertension, is if they have a mixed picture or it's just all dri driven by wedge pressure. Because uh, I still feel, like I said, clinically, we think HEFPEF doesn't have treatments. I still will say that if you find a patient with HEFPEF that uh, you think you can restore sinus rhythm, all, by all means, please try that. The other thing is if you invasively refer someone for right heart catheterization and they have mixed pulmonary hypertension, they have RV dysfunction, I think PD-5 inhibitors should be tried. Uh, other than that, obviously, it's diuretic management and blood pressure control. So that, that was the answer to the, the first uh, question. The second question is, uh, where, why, why is the, our, our treatments failing? So I think one problem we're having with all these trials that I've seen in HFPEF uh, first of all, our defining criteria of HEFPEF is, is very erratic. For example, in the RELAX trial, I, ha I, I did all the uh, RV assessments on these patients. So in the, even in the RELAX trial, I found patients with cardiac amyloidosis. I found patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And these are not HEFPEF. So, I mean, if you're going to give the same drug to everyone, I think that that's not, not the way to go. I think the way to go now would be subtyping HEFPEF, um, at least in HEFPEF, I think that should be true for all, but in HEFPEF in particular, you need to subtype these patients. And one of the subtypes, which we think is about a third of the population, are these patients with abnormal RVPA coupling and, 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 and then treat them with targeted therapies rather than throwing a PD-5 inhibitor at everyone. Because actually in the RELAX trial, some patients got significantly worse in terms of symptoms with, with PD-5 inhibition. And those were probably those patients that were all had wedge-driven pulmonary hypertension. So, so that I, I do think we need to identify these patients. I just don't have a, a, a quick answer to how we can f identify them at an earlier stage. Dr. Nader. What you showed in the relaxed last group, the fourth group with the RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension looked like, as you've repeatedly mentioned, a sicker group. So is the RV and end stage sort of phenomenon that develops? If this is where an inflammatory state that is driving a lot of what is present, you would expect an early involvement of the RV, not simply a reaction to the increase in the pulmonary artery pressures. Yeah. So are, are there data that you're aware of outside animal models that show an early involvement of the RV in patients with HEFPEF? Uh, yes, um, so it's a very good question. Um, so actually, uh, just to clarify some of the data that I showed. So yes, they had more severe heart failure, but there were two other aspects of the abnormal RVPA coupling group. Number one, which was unfortunate, but 83%, 82% had AFib. And so again, there was a rhythm issue that could have been causing RV dysfunction out of proportion because just the group before it that had uh, uh, RV, uh, just uh, pulmonary hypertension, no RV dysfunction, did not have that much AFib. So one kicker was AFib. The other thing is there was a lot of neurohormonal activation. I can go back to those table. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of neurohormonal activation. There are animal studies with carvedilol in RV failure that have shown reversal of RV dysfunction and when there was a uh, high neurohormonal activation. <clears throat> so I think that um, g coming back to the same point of phenotyping, that I, I think that yes, there is gonna be a profile of patients that are gonna have advanced heart failure and the RV is just the final phenomena. But then if they have high neurohormonal activation or high, so biomarkers can be utilized here. I think if we can use biomarkers to utilize their, their patients, I know for sure, uh, I am not aware of human studies, but in animal studies, where in HEFPEF with group two pulmonary hypertension, patients, uh, the, 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 the animal models that had high endothelium one levels, by giving PD-5 inhibition, they had improvement in LV diastolic function, improvement in pulmonary hypertension and RV function. So my point is by a biomicro profile of all HEFPEF patients would not be similar. I think some patients have more neurohormonal activation, some patients have higher endothelium one levels, and by targeting specific patients to their biomarker profile and their phenotypic profile, I think may lead to some success in management of HEFPA. So how serious should one pursue the recognition of RV dysfunction? We see frequently patients with hypertension, evidence of elevated filling pressure, some symptoms. Just a visual assessment of their RV function appears normal. 
what is the trigger to say I should have more concern, more suspicion for the RV function, particularly that it looks there is no specific treatment that is uniquely targeted to this issue. And even the vasodilators, as has men been mentioned by others, is they pay the price of a high watch pressure, hard to reconcile someone, yes, we've helped them by dropping their pulmonary vascular resistance, and their PA pressures have gone down, but their wedge pressure, like the case you showed, 15 or 20 to 36. So is this worth pursuing? Is the RV the right target here? So, so RV is just one target. So in the absence of a generalized target for HFPEF patients, we're trying to phenotype patients to what a profile that can receive benefit, because RV, patients who have RV dysfunction are far more symptomatic than patients who don't have RV dysfunction. That's what I also showed in this data. Their, their peak VO2 is much lower if you have RV dysfunction. So they're much more symptomatic, much more frustrated with their symptoms and quality of life. So there, there's an opportunity for intervention. At, 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 as a whole for HFPEF phenotype, I agree that if you, it, because it's predominantly left-sided filling pressures, that are actually, we, we, it's a combination thing that we do for these patients. It's basically we, 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 we en enhance diuretics and, and, and we put them on PD-5 inhibitors with, with some success. I can tell you though one thing, I know this data is not out and I didn't want to bring it forward, that I think that uh, the Entresto might be a, a very positive trial. Uh, Entresto with its secubitral uh, component in HFPEF, there is some very promising data that these patients' symptoms are improving and their filling pressures are, left side filling pressures are coming down and their actually diastology is improving. So this is the Paragon heart failure trial. It, it's almost completed, um, but uh, the, I think that there may be a benefit of Entresto that is on the horizon. So final comment and, and we'll close. Um, certainly we don't have a treatment strategy, strategy specific for this patient population. Investigation needs to happen. But I think one of the take home messages is the prognostication using echo in patients with heart failure preserved, yeah. And you focused in on RV fractional area change and or RV contraction, annular motion of the tricuspid valve. Um, one thing we see clinically is RV size. It's the yeah. RV's out of, RV remodeling out of proportion to LV in a simple surrogate of the RV's big compared to the LV. Yeah. Did you examine that to understand its implication from a prognostic standpoint? Sure. Because for me, that's, that's the easiest one, right? And to, to readily sure. report and for <coughs> others to visualize. So if you can yeah. comment on that, yeah. and again, fantastic talk. All right, so, 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 so unfortunately, we, we, we did not look at this. And the other, other uh, echocardiographic studies in heart failure, they did uh, in HFPEF, that studied RV dysfunction did not look at RV size, except for one by Borlaug. It was an inpatient cohort. And he showed that patients who did have RV dysfunction were far more likely to have dilated right ventricles, but that RV size didn't correlate with outcomes. What did correlate was RV fractional area change. Perfect. Thank All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks All right. Again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Excellent. All right.